Hello humans, mercantilists, belter loaders, and eco-fascists, and welcome to the Cosmic Tortoise Podcast. This is the second of the regular chats with Michael and James. This is purely a hangout format, so we just talk anything that comes into our mind, and it can get very silly, and none of it should be taken too seriously, as I mentioned on the previous one. That's about all I have to say. If anybody would like to send in their dreams, because we're going to do some high-tier professional dream analysis of your dreams in the next episode. If you'd like to send those in, send them into cosmictortoisemusic at gmail.com. Otherwise, enjoy. Spit into them, but we can all shave our heads and make awful looking meals. Oh, does he make awful looking meals? Absolutely horrendous. I'm a member of the Food Court, a Facebook group where people post, um, I guess, uncanny uh, food preparation ideas, and amongst them are some truly terrifying and horrific dishes. Joe Rogan being the king of that. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Yeah, seriously, have a look at the state of his meals, they are quite <laughs> something. <laughs> What does, what does he do? Is it just super high protein? Yeah, well, I mean, he's doing the whole sort of keto thing. Um, but the presentation is god-awful. Everything looks overcooked or undercooked. Uh, <laughs> there's oil smeared all over the plate in random directions. Um, I'm sure someone might consider it abstract art, but I find it uh, very aesthetically displeasing, as do the other members of Food Court, so it's a regular thing that's posted. So he didn't get any tips from Bourdain when he was, when he was around. <laughs> Did you know Mark from Mark Sally Apple was on Rogan? And no, he, and he converted, Mark Sisson. Mark Sisson was on Rogan and he changed quite a few of Rogan's ideas on food. In, in what way? Just paleo stuff, I guess. He just took him and talked about keto and a bunch of stuff. So Mark Sisson, for one, we need to remember he's not, you know, he isn't actually trained in any of this. We should introduce who he is. Okay, so Mark Sisson runs a website called Mark's Daily Apple and there is sort of a, a blueprint, I think it's called, for his way of eating. And he, uh, he's, he he actually sort of calls out paleo on being a little bit too sort of religious in its values. Uh, he calls his attitude towards food primal. Yeah. So if, if Grok, the archetypal caveman, uh, were to eat something, then we should too. Uh, but then also, if Grok didn't have access to, say, high oleic sunflower oil... <laughs> There's no reason why we should refrain from eating it because it's full of good monounsaturated fats and there are hardly any polyunsaturated fats and the omega-6 to 3 ratios are in favour of omega-3. Yeah, he's, he's tries, tries to be evidence-based paleo but not going too crazy and with some cheats allowed, I suppose. Yeah. We followed his website for quite, quite closely for a while, didn't we? No, absolutely. It's a yeah. very good starting point for building any kind of a healthy diet. I mean, he, he takes the approach of using the primal philosophy or what would the hypothetical uh, grok recognize as food and what would his lifestyle and diet be like um, and just uses that as a reference point mm. to then begin building on scientifically. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the paleo thing can get quite forward. Oh, yeah, and unscientific at times. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and pretty meat-centric. I love. Well, meat, that's meat, uh, there's a meat. process by which yeah, the body turns protein into glycogen. Um and I think a lot of the you know people who are on the Atkins diet and people who follow the paleo diet are eating so much protein, they're actually no longer in ketosis and they're just putting huge stress on their liver. So, yeah, yeah I think there is a balance here that needs to be struck. And Mark's Daily Apple, I agree, James, is certainly a good place to start. Yeah. yeah. Is he into the genetic-based nutrition? Yeah. Oh, Rhonda Patrick actually just updated her um, genomic analysis tool. Yes. Oh, yeah? I ran myself through it, did you? I, I did, yeah. What came up? Oh, it was um, mostly the same stuff that I'd already got from Prometheus. Ah, okay. So Prometheus is a tool uh, which allows you to upload your genetic data, your genome, in text format, and then you download sort of an interpretation of that and how you might be prone to prostate cancer, but you might be resistant to Alzheimer's, and you may have you know longevity genes such as FOXO3, et cetera. And then uh, there's a separate website run by this molecular biologist that we follow called Rhonda Patrick, who has her own tool, uh, and she's just updated it. So I uploaded my genome and discovered I might last a little bit longer than I thought, and I might also be a little bit more resistant to Alzheimer's than I previously thought. Oh, that's good. Mm. But I'm still going to vape because nicotine is neuroprotective. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that, that was one of the um, 
one of the SNPs that I thought was conspicuously missing from the latest, uh, you know, Find My Fitness analysis tool. That's the infamous RS5882 SNP. What's that? Yeah. Um, it's one of the ones that have been, I think it was like originally picked up and studied in Ashkenazi populations, mm-hmm. but it's linked to significantly lower risk of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease in old age and also a longer lifespan. Yeah. Mm. I've got most of the not so great FOXO3 variants. I've got only one of the positive FOXO3 variants, so I need to do more saunas. Yeah. Okay, so the, so the FOXO3 variants, I'm, st- I'm very confused about. So FOXO3 is uh, considered the gold standard in terms of longevity. Uh, it can increase the lifespan of a worm by twofold. Uh, it can increase the lifespan of a mouse uh, by one, 1. 1.5-fold. Uh, in humans, uh, if you have one working copy, you are uh, 1.5 times more likely to live to 100. And if you have two working copies, you are... Um, one point, sorry, two to two point seven times more likely to hit a hundred. And now I have both working copies of that. But then you're discussing something other than those first. Two. Oh well, in, in her report, it specifically brought up about there were five different SNPs in the FOXO3 gene that were relevant. Right. Mm. Yeah. So I was looking at those, and I'm confused as to like how they relate to the in, the Fo- FOXO3 as we know it being just simply turned on or turned off. Yeah, th- those might be re- results related to one particularly powerful SNP, I'm not sure. Okay, so that one particularly powerful SNP is the one that Rhonda Patrick referred uh, people to in her video about nutrigenomics, and it is the one that is most commonly referenced uh, in scientific studies. So I, I, I'm i very ignorant when it comes to anything beyond that or, or beneath that. It, it sounds like there's a, you know, a richness of information I've completely missed. Yeah. The FOXO3 studies were done with Japanese men, right? Sudden, I think, yeah, like that's that's what it's based on, and she hypothesizes that heat shock proteins could turn on FOXO3. They're not sure if it does, right? And cold shock proteins, and cold shock proteins, yeah. yeah. So, sauna use and you know, ice baths yeah. can activate FOXO3, which then so it's sort of weird because that means it has, it has an epigenetic effect, which uh, basically means that it affects your gene expression. And that's a pretty profound change in your gene expression because when you act, if you are to hypothetically activate one of your copies of FOXO3 through like you know sauna use or ice baths, then that starts to then have an epigenetic effect in and of itself because FOXO3's primary function is to uh, sort of change your gene expression. So it turns on good genes and turns off bad genes much in the same way that fasting does. Hmm. So it's sort of an epigenetic, epigenetic effect. Hmm. Powerful. Yeah. Hmm. So Mumbai, this is totally unrelated to nutrigenomics, but <laughs> Mumbai has banned plastic bottles and bags with a penalty of up to 25,000 rupees, which is about 366 US dollars, and a sentence of three months jail. So people are losing their shit because they're doing everything in plastic bags in Mumbai, but I think it's a good move. What do you guys think? I'm a I'm sort of an eco fascist, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what kind of domestic political developments would be behind that, but that's um, very promising to see. Um, one of the, I guess, sort of like, uh, dirty secrets of pollution is that I guess the vast majority of plastics pollution that are in the world's oceans originates uh, in like Indian, particularly subcontinental and other Asian countries, rivers that are just kind of dumped, mm. used as waste disposal. So that's like a, could could become quite a significant effect. Mm. It's a good start. And I think we've talked about this before, but it seems like systemic change or strict strict systemic regulations would be a much more efficient way to reduce pollution and plastic in the environment than just relying on the consumer to decide to not take a plastic bag that day. Hmm. I've just come here from watching uh, uh, a documentary made by Adam Curtis, uh, and I, I imagine the thesis of many people who were involved in um, the making of that documentary or you know, more so interviewed in that documentary would disagree. Uh, I can't make a compelling argument uh, on their behalf, but... It's all watched over by Machines of Love and Grace, mm-hmm. uh, which is an Adam Curtis documentary made in 2011. And, uh, it it centres around Anne Rand and the collective, which was an Anne Rand 
uh, circle of people who went round and read Atlas Shrugged as it was being written and all the rest. And they would they would say the complete opposite. But James, you might be able to help make a compelling argument on their behalf because I can't. What what do you think the outline of the argument they would make is? That it should be down to the consumer. I mean, let's let's just use an anecdote. Um, where are we? It was Lauren Carpenter. Yeah. So he's a computer graphics researcher and developer. He invited a large number of people into a hall and got them to play. Separated them into two teams. They had a bat with red and uh, green on it, and they were playing a game, a computer game projected onto a big screen of um, Pong, and <laughs> uh, like eighties Pong. Yeah. Uh, ping pong, pong. I think it's just called pong. Just called pong. Do, do. Yeah. Do. So each team would have to raise the uh, green. If they showed green, hold up, hold up green, it would make their uh, baton rise, and red would make it lower. And the thing is, is that you think that's fairly simple, and everyone just cooperates because it's quite easy to understand. But if the ball, say, goes only two thirds of, maybe a half the way up, and you're at the bottom then if everyone goes green, it would fly up to the top and miss it. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So some people would have to use red to, to slow down the progression upwards in real time. And it, somehow it worked, and there's no way of explaining that. There was a sort of hive mind effect. Yeah, or ultimately you just have a degree of self-knowledge about where you fit in the sort of accelerating versus retarding spectrum, <laughs> and, then, and then you just map your own actions onto that you know function. Yeah, but isn't it remarkable that it worked? I mean, I watched it, and, and this game went on for quite a while. Who were the players? Just random people that he invited. Right. Yeah. So hmm. then, yeah. Was there? So this was. Did this end up being communicated? in a way with it, you know, communicated without words or whatever. So they were just... Oh, um, I think it was like a video camera that was like watching the audience and the computer program was interpreting it. Yeah, but words are important because when I watched it, some people were yelling, green, green! <laughs> and I imagine if I heard someone yelling green and I saw that the ball was only going to halfway and we'd miss it if we all went green, I'd go red immediately to slow down all the people that are just following orders. Mm. So you, you might be right, James, but it's really strange that it worked with com a completely random sample of the demographic. When you say it worked, how how well they could just play a game as normal? In indefinitely, they could just keep it up. It yeah. Like. Did it not speed up? No. Ah, okay. Regular pong? Or? Regular pong speeds up every hit. No, that didn't happen. Okay. No, no. That'd be impressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not ants. Yeah. But we behave like them sometimes. and That's, that's a truly fascinating experiment. Yeah. Yeah, There's there's a bit of literature on that isn't there with crowds and so, so and what things. you what you might be really leading into there with the connection to um the plastification or deplastification of economies um is really the the presence of social phase transitions where people spontaneously flip from one equilibrium to another hmm. where the where the easy thing to do um changes from being you know one mode of action to the other that's, that would be the kind of equilibrium that you'd have to affect through you know, individual means or the kind of equilibrium that you could use as an alternative to um, authoritarian control. Mm. So that would be uh, some sort of cultural shift and everybody would just decide not to use plastic bags anymore or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. But it I mean, relies on the communication of a lot of cultural knowledge. It requires the communication of the knowledge of what it means to be a person who uses a plastic bag or doesn't use a plastic bag, and then for people to um, reflexively make their decisions based on that, mm. and you know what they what they desire to locally signal to their own peer groups. Yeah, yeah, that's how I see it being not impossible, but very very difficult because it's not just plastic bags. I mean, plastic bags is pretty low on the list of all the different issues that we have, and we're oversaturated now with issues with awareness campaigns for every single cause that you can think of. It's just completely oversat oversaturation. So, you know, you get on Facebook and you, if you spend enough time scrolling, you'll see dozens of different types of causes. And whereas in the seventies or something, there might've been one that becomes a social meme and that's very easy to, to gain traction traction. Yeah. And, I'm just sort of yeah. The, the attentional the attentional economy <laughs> was a lot different. It was 
easier for single large memes to take hold. Yeah, and and so when you have such a huge amount of issues, it seems like it would be better for the system to just eliminate those by brute force and just let the people deal with it and in and, and a way that wouldn't completely fuck your economy or your trade deals or whatever. Okay, so so that sort of, I think that oversaturation is key here. Yeah. Because it, right now, everything is bad. Everything is a problem. The world is going to end. Humanity is going to become extinct, right? So why bother? Well, I think what we've, what we've got going in our favor is that over time, some of these things pass from being active parts of the attention or the attention economy into being uh, part of the cultural bedrock so that they can be assumed and they no longer have to be actively promulgated or promulgated mm -hmm. to have an effect. But it's incredibly difficult to do that when you have, say, people on podcasts saying it takes five hours to carve a banana. <laughs> <laughs> And going on and on about bloody cashew nuts. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I'm I'm down to four hours. <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. Yeah. So, I mean, they already have a supermarket in Germany that has no packaging. That was, I think, launched last year. So you show up. I assume there'd be reusable packaging you can buy while you're there. But if you show up without a bag or without your containers, you just fucked so you have to buy them Just carry around a bunch of beans in your hands yeah <laughs> yeah yeah from the, from the baked bean baked bean uh yeah you know pot so do you think it's possible james for sort of that localized community-based virtue signaling to resolve these issues or, or do you think eco-fascism is the way <laughs> <laughs> i i'm willing to bet that um that someone like say slavoj zizek would say that Eco-fascism or eco-communism would be the only solution. <laughs> Who's that character? Oh, he's um, you know the infamous Slovenian political philosopher, right? Um, who's who's known for his like extended diatribes and wild um, <laughs> gesticulations, right? Gesticulations and and sniffing, and uh. sniffing. Like all good eco-fascists, you know, sniff intermittently. Yes. Well, I, I wouldn't call Trump an eco-fascist. Trump? Do they sniff he intermittently? A lot, yes. ah. He could be an eco-fascist in disguise. Maybe that's he's, his grand plan. He's definitely got a, a large beef with, like, activist consumerism. Mm -hmm. Seeing it as a massive distraction. Right. And act actively harmful, giving people a false impression of... Um, doing something to soothe social problems. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's part of what this plastic bag thing is, right? Like, I mean, it's a bit tokenistic to just use, you know, some reusable bag and keep creating mountains and mountains of waste. That's what I mean, yeah. If you... It's all, yeah, it's all very well to, to buy the reusable bag, but all the things that you're putting in the reusable bag are in plastic packaging. And, I mean, there's the other effect which is that the you know the dark matter of industrial civilization <laughs> is still largely out of sight it's it's hidden to the consumer mm -hmm. we have no real mechanism to gain visibility of the industrial processes that allow our entire existence mm. <laughs> yeah no That's way oh, except through documentaries uh. yeah. Yeah, we we do need to spread curiosity. Yes, yes, for sure. Do you see it being a possibility that because the problem with if you if you just suddenly said, oh, you know, let's say Jacinda Ardern, eco fascist Jacinda Ardern decides to ban all plastic in supermarkets, you know, let's just be really silly about it. It's obviously impossible because of all the imported goods and their and the, the logistics of storing things without plastic is much trickier than it isn't. <laughs> uh, let's say that you could solve the challenge of storing a lot of the food or having a supermarket with out pack plastic packaging and, and bulk bins and things like this where you can come pick things up. It would need to be some kind of coordinated effort sort of global effort with trading partners and then all have to agree to do that. And that's that's almost an insurmountable goal as well, it sounds like. Yeah, I was going to mention nation states when you were 
uh, speaking about this sort of social cohesion and, and all the rest, it's like you, you may end up crippling your own economy yeah. uh, versus the rest of the nation states that don't care and are using yeah, yeah, multiple exactly. plastic bags. Yeah. yeah. So it needs to be worldwide. So you don't need to just be an eco-fascist. You have to be a globalist eco-fascist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a one-world government globalist eco-fascist. That's what we need. That's, that's what Done. we need, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's been an interesting um, dynamic to observe. You see things like the unilateral uh, push in China for China, China. Um, for the adoption of renewable sources of energy. Now, obviously, there is a large uh, market mercantilist element to what they're doing. Sorry, James, mercantilist? So the <laughs> deliberate operation of state industrial policy to uh, favor modes of industrial production mm. that puts your country or civilization at a long-term strategic advantage. Uh, China's mm. good at that. So mm. they are good at that. Mm. They're good at a number of things like that. Mm -hmm. And this comes, this is playing out right now, in fact, in the United States with the, uh, I believe it's the Suniva uh, trade case, a United States solar panel uh, manufacturing company, they took a case to the Federal Trade Commission basically saying that China was undercutting them by dumping state subsidized solar panels on the US domestic market and forcing American manufacturers to go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and this case did go to the um, Federal Trade Commission and they um, ultimately were successful in applying a tariff to imported solar panels. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, eh? Yeah. The tariff's the solution, though. No, I mean, every country needs to be doing this. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's, do we protect our solar panel production companies or do we just all use cheap Chinese solar panels and we all have renewable energy. Exactly. That's a, that's a really interesting question. And to even um, get close to answering it, you need to go quite deep into mercantilist economics in general. Right. Um, which, which obviously I find very interesting, but not everyone else necessarily would. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, well then, well then uh, after having delved deeply into mercantilist economics, uh, what would you be able to summarize uh, your interpretation as being? Well, my interpretation at the moment, uh, without, without getting into it, is that ultimately the actions of the Chinese government are benefiting global consumers. Uh, they are paying a domestic premium by uh, taking state resources to subsidize, subsidize the production of a consumer good that will be consumed outside their borders. Mm. Um, for a for an unknown strategic gain in the long term, but it is accelerating the uh, technological adoption mm. of these technologies. So I would say that it's an overriding concern. Mm. Mm. So yeah, and then it gets very muddy on what economic advantages you gain by having renewable energy in your country, even if it's from somewhere else, mm -hmm. because they get very, very muddy as opposed to, you know, pollution or production. Blah, blah, blah. Hmm. There was some shifty business like that going on in New Zealand, I think with, with, uh, not with production, but with power companies and solar users, right? Yeah. There were, well, people are going off the grid, uh, so yeah. to speak. Um, but I actually, I recall, it was in the the, Island, I recall right? the, the Greens uh, leader, co-leader, um, I forget, was it, was it the current, was it James, it was before James Shaw, wasn't it? It was Russell Norman posted a very fuzzy, a warm fuzzy post about how, you know, this couple had built a house and it's all solar panels and it's, they're off the grid. And James, I remember you having some fairly stark commentary on that <laughs> and getting into an argument with a bunch of Green voters. Um, I've got, I've got many hour long rants on the subject of, um, you know, renewable energy policy and electricity feed-in tariffs and they're all highly um entertaining if you can stomach several hours of that <laughs> <laughs> but i mean um oh, I, I saw i saw an article in the press just last week uh pinned by some kind of greens member and it was it was pretty dire 
um, in terms of the level of understanding mm. of the energy market. In, in the long term, uh, the structural problems that we have are all solvable. We just need to structure the market correctly. Basically, uh, our legacy electricity market is still a relic of the time where you had a like a unidirectional flow of energy basically just from um, centralized producers to consumers mm -hmm. and that the most uh, fair and you know rational way of levying people for the actual value that they're extracting from a power system was based on levy levying the energy usage just like by a meter now that's like quickly being shown to be a an unrealistic model in insofar as it's actually uncorrelated with the demands and the value that people extract from a power grid, mm. particularly when you add domestic uh, generation into the mix. So we need to move to a model where we're more accurately capturing that. Mm -hmm. And then I believe that all, most of these issues will simply evaporate. Yeah. Mm. What does that model look like? Oh, it looks something very close to a a real-time market for energy where um, where we slice down to very fine time scales and price in real time the consumption and generation of energy um, pricing it on the time scale of the electrical network itself hmm. what's it currently priced on well so like the market um, the, the, hours or the bulk electricity markets on like half hourly um, things there's like uh, experimental elements that are, I think, done in like five minute segments. And that, that's probably good enough for some purposes. Um, but the point is that because consumers aren't being charged um, at that level of fine grained bandwidth, they have no opportunity to actually adjust their behavior in, in response to that. Mm. Okay. Uh, I see. So if you so, have high resolution of what can, what you know, you had the oven on for half an hour at fan bake with the door open. Um, yeah, because you went, exactly. if, you, if you forgot that it was open, then you went outside to, you know, water your cacti, and then you came back in, and then you could look back on the this high resolution time scale of your energy usage, and you can say, oh look, I, within that twenty seven minutes, my power usage peaked to this well, point, and it cost power. me this, it, it cost me this exact amount of money. Yeah, well, so wow, the, the real okay. the real endpoint is having all of your um, energy producing and consuming. Uh, elements in your home of deciding for themselves or like, you know, with some amount of user preference setting when it's basically how much they value energy at different times of day and deciding when to, when to use themselves. So would this, how much more efficient would this make energy usage? Oh, quite a lot more. Yeah. I mean, New Zealand's a really uh, lucky country to be in from a renewable energy point of view because we have a, a large quantity of hydropower. Mm. Um, what this means is that we're not actually constrained by immediate production capacity. We're constrained by total energy over like daily, weekly, monthly timescales, mm -hmm. which is exactly what we can contribute to with um, other sources of energy. Mm -hmm. And it being hydro is essentially why it's a little silly to go off the grid. Yeah, exactly. The The grid is a, a massive resource which can be beneficially used Um I mean, basically, the only time where the economics of going totally off the grid makes sense, if you allow for the presence of a rational pricing model, is when the actual costs of connection to the grid overwhelm the benefits that you get from it. Hmm. And, and those apply in actually vanishingly few situations. Hmm. How do you guys feel? Did we talk about this last time? I can't remember. About, I've seen a few people talking on Twitter about how they believe monarchies are far superior to democracies, even terrible ones. I, I think we've spoken about that, but not in a podcast. So, yeah, I I feel like something about mold bug is about to emerge. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been. A, it's it's this idea. I mean, this is sort of triggered also by this. James is talking about how China has kind of a much more long term plan for energy production than or sustainable energy production than probably anywhere in the world. And that's in part helped by the fact that they're not constrained by four, four or five-year election cycles. Uh, so they can, you know, Xi Jinping can actually look forward 20 years and, and 
be reasonably sure that what he's planning will actually come to fruition, whereas mm. all the democracies is every four years, three years, five years, whatever. I look at what Trump's done. He's, he's torn, torn up almost everything about him. Yeah, yeah. They'll just come in and destroy everything and then rebuild and destroy whatever, every Swing, election cycle. Swings and roundabouts, eh? Yeah, and <laughs> Australia is probably potentially one of the worst Western democracies ever because it's been in gridlock for over a decade with just absolute nonsense mm. and they can't get anything done. It's just a nightmare. So I, I, that's, I mean, Winston Churchill, what did he say? He said democracy is the worst form of government except every other system, every other form. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But... But what surely, do you guys think? Well, surely, James, you can uh, summarize maybe Moldbug's take on this to some extent. Well, I'm not sure if I could, but there's there's definitely a lot of... Um, th that's the real question, isn't it? Whether there's any room for improvement over over Winston Churchill's somewhat facile statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, have we tried the others? There's others that we have scarcely conceived of. Mm. You, you, I mean, uh, let alone had the technological basis to begin to practically implement. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, that, that does sort of tie into uh, the documentary I was just watching uh, because it was it was Alan Greenspan um, who, who featured in it and he was sort of advocating for something completely different for quite a while and he managed to convince Bill Clinton. He was from Anne Rand's uh, collective um, so he was an objectivist, and so that basically means, you know, um, well, let's just call it a type of libertarianism. And he wound up being the head of Federal Reserve under Bill Clinton, and he convinced Bill Clinton to implement a number of austerity measures, um, and then it all kind of flopped, and he changed his mind. And, and that's where James is saying, well, we haven't tried these things. And people say, yeah, we have. Alan Greenspan convinced Bill Clinton to, you know, do this and that. But then he flopped on it and changed his mind and the, the government sort of went back into authoritarian mode and control of the economy and the likes. So there are a lot of systems that haven't actually yet been tried. Not that I'm advocating for an objectivist <laughs> system. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. 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 Well, th this is why uh, a lot of the more fringe political thinkers are advocates for experiments in governance that either involve like the fracturing of existing polities into smaller and more experimental structures or the construction of entirely de novo political units like this is where we have seasteading for example or certain kinds of free city initiatives what's de novo well like from from nothing like right, new... right, right, right. and by free city uh, initiatives are we talking about things like seasteading well, yeah, like Liberland. self self governed <laughs> self governed cities and principalities that um, only that either have no or small amounts of uh, sovereignty devolved to whatever host state they are in or nearby. So, so a good example of that is seasteading. We should yep. have a quick yarn about that. What's that? Well, I only just learned about it, and James was already already familiar. We watched a documentary the other night on Silicon Valley, uh, and we were sort of, you know, exploring various ideas that a lot of people there hold dear and those various ideas aren't that varied it seems they're all very convinced of um, exactly what you've just discussed there well, some some variety of techno utopianism but with a particular bent yeah so it, it touched on seasteading which is I, I think i'd prefer you to explain that james you know, you know more about it oh that that's just the concept of trying to create uh, new political units based in the sea where nobody has any jurisdiction. International so waters. International waters, baby. You can just <laughs> slap a bunch of ships together and like, yeah. build, a, build an apartment block on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, who's, like, who's, who's, who's doing this? Who, who wants to do this? Well, the, the, main, the main body is the Seasteading Institute. Um, they've, they've received money from Peter Thiel. Um, Peter Thiel, uh, he's, I think he founded PayPal. Yes. Uh, he also supported Trump, yeah. um, but if you look at sort of his various like speeches, he's just very forthright and, and outspoken. Um, I think the reason that he endorsed Trump wasn't because he, you know, is a Republican who thinks Trump's great. He wants to just destroy government, basically. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, like he was he was super hype um, on, for example, having the opportunity to potentially revamp some of the rules surrounding the FDA. So the Food and Drug Administration. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, Peter Thiel 
is a he's pretty big on like health research uh life extension technology and like many others he's really upset at the way that the current bureaucratic structure of the fda does not allow for um drug development and research into things that are not and it's things like life extension like you, you're only allowed to make a drug for it if it's in the process of killing you you can't yeah. you can't actually try to make people's lives better prevention and and this is more or less like coded into the into the unofficial law that is the practices of the fda mm -hmm. so with trump he saw a bit of an opportunity uh to you know potentially slip something in there mm. That's quite and we'll, we'll see yeah. what happens. Prevention huh. instead of band-aid stuff. Um, yeah. Prevention or enhancement. <laughs> I think it sounds more like enhancement. Well, Which enhancement's is, fine. Dude, I'm, I'm fine, I'm with, fine that. with enhancement. I don't know why anyone isn't. It's, no. I mean, they they just you know imagine warlocks, don't they? They imagine these like bestial uh, figures that uh, have very you know machine-like precision and you know are able to. Create, the government's been able to create armies of these people. People always sort of see uh, enhancement as being like dystopic. Yeah. And I think that's really unfortunate. Well, it's that's the whole transhumanist thing. That's what people fear about transhumanism. And especially if you don't know what it is or you've only heard some fringe ideas about what it is or what it could be. Yeah. And or if you've seen a few movies of genetic mutants or, or cyborgs and that's what you think it's going to be. Yeah. I mean, it could be both of those things, and it could be many other things, and it probably will be. But the way I look at all that is, it seems if you if you look at what we've been up to for the last fifty years, that's just the path that we're heading down. That's our trajectory. Is we're going to change ourselves. We're going to enhance ourselves. We're going to. I mean, you can look at what we've done with plastic surgery. That's already pretty fucking extreme. Some like the Barbie lady, these guys putting these implants in their in their bodies to try and look really muscly, but they just look, <laughs> they just look uh, very interesting instead. <laughs> and Ooh, interesting. Yeah. It's, it's inevitable. And if you accept that it's an inevitability provided that we don't destroy ourselves, then it becomes less scary and it's more interesting. So that's really interesting that Peter Thiel wants to, I mean, life extension is pretty, it's more on the chill end of the men, like more relaxed end of a lot of the things that could happen with transhumanism. Yeah. Well, um, medical, medical technologies and biotechnologies are touted as possibly one of the means for seasteads or these, uh, floating cities that have no uh, national jurisdiction. Every time you say that, I get a wee dopamine burst. What? <laughs> Who knows these what? I'll just mean the mention of Having precisely that. No, um, no national government to harry well, no. well it's not just that it's also the sea city part oh uh, <laughs> michael's just excited about floating cities and yeah the, i just want to be in a floating city extending <laughs> my life right like. his part no so like those kinds of biotechnologies have been touted as ways for seasteads to be financially self-sustaining um hmm. so there's all kinds of like juicy gene therapy and experimental biotechnologies that i mean maybe in mexico you could go and do that but in a lot of first world countries, there'd be rules that would prevent you from, you know, self-experimenting on your own body and your own life. Wow. So we might have these secret crazy labs in the middle of the ocean creating freak humans. Well, people are already uh, doing this in the basements. Well, yeah, there's the, the grinders. You mean the app? <laughs> well, there's the app too, but it's a different type of grinder. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Right. Particular... Um, subcategory of well, biohackers. Or, biohackers, yeah. They... Particularly the ones who are who are interested in the old-fashioned meat surgery. Yeah, yeah. For example, they have implants. Some some of them like to put implants. But they put magnets underneath their fingertips, so you can feel electromagnetivity, right? Like electromagnetism with your hands, and it actually becomes kind of a sense because your nerves and nerve endings meld around the magnets and because you're an electric creature mm. you can just put your hand in front of a electronic device like a computer and you can feel the electromagnetism so they're they're doing weird stuff like that should there be rules against that what do you two think uh there should be rules against parents <laughs> modding their kids 
What I, about, what about think, genetically engineering human embryos so that they're more resistant to disease? That's fine. I'm talking about if you had a child and then you decided to put implants into your child uh, purely for fun, such as the electromagnetic finger thingy. So there should be rules against uh, recreational uh, modifications of children. Um, well, much in the same way that trans therapy should not be put upon a child. That child. That, I'm unsure about that, Matt. Yeah, you're unsure about that. Oh yeah, yeah. Are you joking? No. So you think that if a parent believes that their four-year-old is biologically female but is a male, they should give them testosterone? Well, too. fortunately, if you're four, that's not much of an issue. It's only as you start to approach puberty that would become relevant. Well, but they're not. They're, they're not <laughs> opera, there's no surgery taking place on three or four-year-olds. Yeah, it's when they begin to realize their uh, sexuality and in turn their gender. And I I have mixed feelings about it, but I am in favor. Oh, of parents deciding to do that. Well, the parents, no, the ch the, the preteen or the teenager has to decide that. And the but there's, parents but have there's to a, then... there are examples of parents giving trans therapy to five-year-olds. Well, I imagine that those That's are, what I mean. Well, that, well that, that's, I mean, few and far between. As James said, it's as they approach puberty, they discover that maybe that X chromosome should have been a Y. And if they do discover that and it's genuine, uh, all the parents have to do is sign a form and allow them to. And I think there are a lot of good parents doing that. Uh, and, and thus far, we've not had any horror stories, really. If we do have a horror story, that's bad and I'm, 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 I'm unhappy that's happened. But so far, it's only been a good thing. Okay. Another example of what wouldn't be cool would be, yeah, it's, uh, I just, I'm not comfortable with parents deciding weird things on their children before the children has agency to ch decide it for, on their own, before the child has agency. Yeah, does, does a child have agency? So, Age so like, nine, like 12, at what point yeah. do you decide to have agency? I'm not sure. That okay. would be up for debate. It's almost similar to what age is an adult. Or what age is consensual sex? Like they're all they're all very slippery and weird and well, that, that's kind of an interesting question in itself. Like, can we actually improve upon our long-standing legal cons constructs of age of majority and freedom of like contracts? When you're of a certain age, you gain the ability to you know to sign your life away to make binding commitments of yourself that you did not previously have. And right what, now, what is what is that? Yeah, sorry. Well, right right now, that just operates as a system of, um, you might say, crude lines in the sand at you know various biological ages, but it could be, it could be beneficial on some environments to allow more flexibility in that, or maybe construct some kind of like a, um, a multi-component. Uh, like legal age score, mm. which is not necessarily your biological age. Yes. I mean, certainly we can we can imagine like both cases of people who are um, responsible before their legal age of majority and people who are not many years later. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there are 12 and 13 year olds with IQs of 140 who are far more mature than a lot of like 40 or 50 year olds who act like children, right? So it's, yeah, it's incredibly fluid. Well, so maybe in a... Uh, in an environment of competitive governance or seasted, you would be able to see experimentation involving those kinds of legal ideas as well. Mm -hmm. hmm. I mean, this still comes into factors such as development of the brain comes into this, right? So, or, or simple life experience is kind of, it's kind of impossible to get a certain amount of life experience within, within only a certain amount of age, right? Oh, I'm unsure because... I mean, if you're a 13 year old, um, you could have condensed a huge amount of life experience and gained huge insight into the world and yourself. Whereas someone who, you know, lived uh, in a bubble for 30 years may have very, a very limited uh, capacity. There's that. There's also potential problems with things like impulse control and emotional control. And it's, it gets really. Really slippery and no, messy, right? I, I think there are some interesting arguments both ways because I, I could I could certainly see the arguments that um, in the cases of people who 
maybe were forced to grow up sooner than they otherwise would have liked, the precedents that were formed and the ideas they came away with weren't necessarily the ones that you want to then go and grant that that unrestricted legal majority to as well. Sure, but at what point would that change? I mean, those I, that sort of identity becomes fairly entrenched, doesn't it? So you're just going to give it an arbitrary five more years and then suddenly you would grant them exactly that? Yeah, so I guess that's why we need the the multi-component. <laughs> yeah, and that gets really complex. So it we gets need super to messy build a, too. We need to build a city in the goddamn sea. Okay? <laughs> and try it all out. Yeah. Well, isn't that nice that they could make smaller states quite small states to experiment and try these things with you know you'd hope with less consequence than if you're trying it on a huge nation state that already exists if it's smaller you can mess with that there's an interesting guy trying to make that character that's trying to found liberland libertarian where is that based did we already talk about that sometime i think we might have but I forget it's when we funny. had microphones with socks on them in our faces and when we didn't. <laughs> you're the only one with a sock on it, Michael. You're yeah. special. Why do, why, do, why am I the sock guy today? Because you're special. Thanks, Ryan. It's like in the middle of some river in the Czech Republic or something on the border. Uh, Liberland, officially the Free Republic of Liberland, is a micronation claiming an uninhabited parcel of disputed land on the western bank of the Danube between Croatia and Serbia. Oh. But the founder is Czech. And yeah, it. they want to, there's this random piece of land that they have claimed, arbitrarily claimed, I believe. And they want to host, last time I heard they were hosting a festival of a few thousand people and they were going to try and storm the land and take it by force <laughs> and, and establish a libertarian utopia. <laughs> I, th- I think that's great. Just like having a party, but with like plausible deniability for having like a mass invasion. <laughs> 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 yeah, he's 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 got it nailed, right? Like, um, yeah, India is just going to have this great big party right on you know, the <laughs> Kashmiri border, <laughs> just having like twenty thousand troops just partying it up. All right, James, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I slid the whiskey your way, Matt. All right. So Trump, we're not going to talk too much about Trump, but I do want to talk about this because I think it's potentially one of my favorite things Trump has announced, and that's the Space Force. <laughs> Force. I'm so excited about the Space Force. How do you guys feel? I like the name. I think he's done really well with the name. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, you've got the Air Force. Yeah. Why can't you have the Space Force, Michael? Yeah. It was precisely. There's no air in space, Michael. <laughs> I, will, um, <laughs> I will defer judgment until I see the uniforms. Oh, the uniforms uh, are going to be the kicker. I don't know. If he gets... If he gets... Uh, What's his What's his daughter's name? Ivanka. If he gets Ivanka on the job, I reckon there could be some pretty tight uniforms. <laughs> she's, she's she seems pretty onto it. She's she's a designer. Yeah, she can, maybe she'll design it. Maybe she'll get commissioned. Surely she will. She get a, you know. Yeah. It's a job. It's a job that needs to be done. Uh-huh. It's an important job. Well, there's a lot of familial adva- advantages uh, going on at the moment. Yeah. The Trump. Yeah. But how do you guys feel if I mean it might be all hot air but if america does have a space force and they st- and they have the first space navy <laughs> the first fleet. very very three body problem there it's a very th- three body problem isn't it i think it's very cool it's there's this series called the expanse which is this sort of sci- do you watch the expanse it's sort of cy- cyberpunk heroic tv series i did i watched the first season and gave up on the second so, yeah, and that's that was my experience exactly. Uh, I stayed, I course. stayed for, I stayed for the visuals and the and the atmosphere. The characters lacked a bit of depth, and it was wasn't postmodern enough for to be cool. It, but, it would have been great in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's actually gotten a bit better recently, but it's a cool concept. And I'm just this whole space force thing made me imagine a similar scenario. So the scenario on the expanse is it's several hundred years in the future. You've got the nation states have changed from being, uh, you know, hundreds of countries in Earth to being Mars, which is now a colony that has rebelled against Earth and declared independence, much like America did from England, mm. from the British Empire. And then you have the Belt, which are these, they've for some reason made them South African <laughs> accented. <laughs> They're kind of like the scum that 
that are working on the asteroid belt mining and they've they they never have lived on a planet and they only live in space and they've all got tattoos and they, they're, they're enormously prejudiced yeah yeah they're very yeah they're very prejudiced mm, and yeah. kind apartheid, of ter- apartheid yeah and they're, they're terrorists and etc yeah. and then you've got the united nations which is earth and they all have their own fleets and space forces and then i just see that trump's just started he might have just been the instigator of the United Future and the United Nations Space Force. So I'm very excited. There's a hilarious video of Trump um, yarning about that. With now, I, I, I'm really bad with names. Who is the the last living uh, member of the team that landed on the moon? Uh, what Armstrong or Mark oh, Aldrin? Oh yeah, Buzz yeah. Aldrin. Aldrin, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He did it too. There's a beautiful, beautiful video. <laughs> Terrific, great. Um, you must see it, of, of Trump just rattling on uh, about space and how great space is, with him standing uh, uh, yeah. behind him. And the, the expressions he's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, quite something, man. Buzz Aldrin's he's quite a wacky character, eh? So, uh, you entirely forgot to mention about the um, the South African belters in The Expanse and their, their famous beltong... oh my god well yes my apologies (laughs) my apologies i can't even say apologies we are all running on less than five hours sleep each tonight yes yes. Uh, so that may explain and more than five whiskeys the lack of coherence in this this talk but there's usually a lack of coherence and that's good it's fine. It might also be the scent of paint in here is also giving us a... Mm. Yeah, sort of doing something to us. Those fumes. Yes. James has discovered a new method of... Getting high. Of, of, no, deodorizing. <laughs> <laughs> deodorizing his backpack. Uh, you know, when you've got a really old backpack and it's starting to get a bit smelly and a bit dirty, James realized that the best way to deodorize it and make it smell nice again is to leave a bottle of wine in the back with the cork night quite on properly mm-hmm. and let it all run through the bag. That's, what, that's how we start. It wonders. It's, it's, current, it's currently resting in the shower cubicle. Yes, it's mm. uh, resting and uh, that, infusing. Mm-hmm. That backpack is actually 14 years old. Well, there you go. It's about time it had a wine infusion. Well, 14 years old is when I first got high. And on the topic of a new way to get high, may I please mm. have some new pips, James? Sure. What is new pipped? James can explain that. New pipped is a good one. <laughs> new pipped new pipped is a white powder that sort of a structural analogue of paracetam, um, which is the base of a large family of nootropics. Mm. The the Rastam family. Isn't it and doesn't it act as an antioxidant within the brain? It or something surely, along those it surely lines. does. That's one of its like most interesting properties. Um, the fact that it can act as an antioxidant and cross the blood-brain barrier, so it can be uh, act as a neuroprotective. It can be neuroprotective uh, in the instance of one taking MDMA. Mm-hmm. And isn't isn't it also good if you get get a good old stroke? Oh yeah, so it's friendly still, old stroke. It was originally <laughs> it was originally developed in the um, Soviet Union, and it's still used still used in the former <laughs> Soviet <laughs> Union so uh, for Sorry. stroke rehabilitation, and just general ischemic brain injury stuff. But it's just not used here. But it's still really good stuff. Mm. If I, I swear, if you were to if you were to administer that in some kind of a large dose. Um, in the immediate aftermath of someone having a stroke, I think that would do a world of good for them. Friendly, <laughs> yeah. friendly old stroke. <laughs> Apologies um, to anyone that is not anyone <laughs> suffering yeah. from a stroke. There's I don't mean to be insensitive, rhyme. but it is in, it is interesting to, to to talk about strokes because one of the oft reported things about strokes about the experience of a stroke is that it is not painful and it is quite peaceful mm-hmm. uh there's a <laughs> the instant friendly old stroke um yeah. there was a i believe there's a ted talk about a woman and she was a she's a neuroscientist and therefore she knew all the signs and 
symptoms of a stroke and she had a stroke and observed herself <laughs> having a stroke <laughs> if, and I can't, I and can't, she, Ryan. what and she she explained that it was very peaceful and she was not afraid at all <laughs> and she watched all the shit go down and and she got through it and it's it's actually a very interesting TED talk so you know was she okay she turned out all right yeah <laughs> Yeah, friendly on stroke now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But yeah, that's why I said that. That's my, my excuse anyway. Well, well, thank you, Ryan. <laughs> it also um, <laughs> it also can raise levels of certain neuronal growth factors. What, a stroke? Um, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say friendlier than we thought. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Is neuronal growth factor necessarily a good thing? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. That's good. Probs. I'm um, satisfied with that answer. There's a gentleman at our local sauna who has been going there for quite a while. He's a large gentleman. I think he's trying to lose weight. And I think he doesn't realize that saunas increase your level of human growth hormone. Uh, mm. So he's probably, if he's, eat, if he's eating a lot, then... Maybe he's actually not going to lose any weight. Maybe he's keeping it. But by human growth hormone, do you mean simply testosterone or no HGH? Oh, oh, okay, yeah. so oh right, sorry. So um, oh, is he, he trying to lose fat or is he just uh, trying to lose everything? I think he, I think he's trying to lose fat. Well, maybe he'll be right then because I mean, if, if he increases his muscle mass, that's then, probably a good thing actually, isn't it? Well, yeah, because yeah. you burn more kilojoules to retain that muscle mass, so mm. that's probably a good thing. Yeah, probably a good thing. He he was probably the guy you were telling me about, the guy who had a friendly old stroke in the sauna. Friendly old stroke, then, then, then. Sorry. Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Right, anyway. Anyway, we've got more, <laughs> there, is we've got, no, there is no segue out of this. We've got so. more politi- politics here, but I think we've talked enough politics for now. I'm a bit. Oh, what do you guys want to talk about? Have you been reading anything interesting lately? Have you seen any interesting documentaries, TV shows? Have you interacted with any weird characters? Discovered any new things? Any weird dreams? James occasionally writes his dreams down, and I, I do recall one dream in particular whereby uh, there were uh, toilets in this tunnel, and they were portals <laughs> to other dimensions. Uh, and, and, and James actually messaged me saying, "I have a dream that I think you'd like, and uh, I have a dream that you might en- enjoy me sharing with you." Uh, and I did. Well, no, that, that was the toilet portal one, but. You messaged me two days ago last night saying oh. that you have a, you've had another one. So oh, there was there was another dream recently. No, I was just looking that up. I don't write down dreams that often. I mostly forget them. Mm. But um, the one that I had just a couple of nights ago, this this dream was set in in Dream Vietnam. I've never been to Vietnam. I've got very little idea what it was like. So this is probably entirely wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> but some of my friends are there at the moment, so that was probably why I was thinking of it. Um, and I was just driving around the the inexplicably dusty back roads of Vietnam in a car. Um, probably the one of the first things that happened, I came across this like traffic disturbance. There was a police car attending a scene, and it turns out that in Dream Vietnam, there's these like gigantic kind of shaggy chickens. <laughs> they stand about like, you know, eight or nine feet high. And one of these gigantic shaggy chickens that had actually... Uh, trampled on someone's regular chicken and <laughs> and the the owner of the regular chicken was trying to get the owner of the shaggy chicken to pay for the chicken that it killed but and it, it turned into a big scene the yeah the cops had to be called it was all kinds of drama and th- there were also there were also these these markets that were full of these enormous shaggy mushrooms the mushrooms were shaggy as well and they were enormous and they were particularly favored by um, old ladies who like to make soup with the shaggy <laughs> mushrooms. <laughs> mm. Shaggy, as in, it's kind of hairy, just like a like a big shaggy dog. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's pretty. That's pretty accurate Th- representation was... of Vietnam, actually. <laughs> um, the the last part of the dream that I remember 
was in some kind of like a tropical lagoon. I presume it's still in Dream Vietnam. And there was a, um, I think I was washed up. I made my way into this abandoned nuclear submarine. I think it used to be an American nuclear submarine. It was just kind of drifting aimlessly in the lagoon, just kind of half out of the water. Uh -huh. And I, I climbed into it and um, it turned out there were some people living inside. Just a, just a bunch of ragtag, a ragtag bunch and... Or anarchists. No, they were sort of just like bogan pirates. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they'd be living in the submarine. But un unfortunately, before it was abandoned, they like shut down the nuclear reactor and it had no power. Or it had it only put out just enough power to run the kitchen. And so they served us this great big breakfast. And they had this really impressive coffee system. <laughs> but the... Uh, I got talking to the captain and he, he showed me all the controls to the submarine and he was he was desperately trying to figure out how to work it because he dreamed of restarting it, firing it back up and sailing away with his crew, but he, he just couldn't quite figure out how to work it. So it sank? No, it's just still chilling. No, uh, it would have sank. Sounds eventually. like a quest, James. It could be a quest. Sounds like he was leading you on to help him. Mm. You're going to go to Vietnam and find the submarine? Well, I'm going to try to find one of those chickens. Yeah. Yeah. What would you do with it? Just ride it. Ride it. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds a bit like a chocobo from Final Fantasy. I think series. so. I think yeah. it actually kind of looks a bit like a chocobo. Yeah. yeah. I'm a big fan of chocobos. I had a dream the other night that I was in a wacky MMO RPG thing in VR, but it was very high quality and very immersive. And other people were there. The starting section was pretty sparse and looked quite like watercolor, sort of watercolor vibe. And then I went walking and I came into this town called The Ronald and it was filled with characters similar to that of Sesame Street. <laughs> but there were fucking dozens and, do well, no, more than dozens, hundreds of these things, big birds and things like that. And they were very, they were spastic as hell. Their eyes were googly and they were just sort of running around spazzing, spazzing out in this, this area. And I tried to take a bit, I took a video of them in the game because it was so bizarre. And that's it. How about we take them? You know, the, 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 it's fairly abstract and bizarre. Dream series of dream rants uh, to offer to any hypothetical listeners the opportunity to send us their dreams so that we can read them out. Uh, and yeah. interpret them. Yeah, we can, we, we can be dream yeah, interpreters. We'll interpret your dream. Yeah, we'll interpret says. your dream. How do you guys interpret me walking in, walking in a VR world Similar to something like Skyrim or whatever, where you've got all these little towns, and there's one on the map called the Ronald, and you walk in there, and it's just completely inhabited by spastic just Sesame Street characters. A lot of them. <laughs> I think your your dream is your dream is trying to tell you that you you got more than you bargained for. <laughs> with what? <laughs> you d you don't know yet. Oh shit! Something. With with your absurdist tendencies, I'd say. Mm. It's very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. How would you interpret my my weird chicken submarine dream? I'd interpret that as a psychic call from the Bogan pirates in the in the decommissioned nuclear submarine to come and help them with your electrical skills, fire it back up and allow them to sail out to the... Seasteading cities. Yes. Where you can experiment and biohack all you like and give agency to 12-year-olds. Yes. Indeed. That's, that sounds good. Yeah. Nailed. Nailed it. Yeah, so do send us your dreams. Do send us your dreams. There's an email address, Ryan. Send your dreams to... I don't know. I don't know what a good email address would be. Just check the show notes. There'll be an email address there, and we'll uh, we'll take any and all dreams, read them out, and interpret them for you. Yes. Would you enjoy your dreams being interpreted by our top tier panel of three dream expert analysis professionals? We'll use your dream to analyze your psyche in ways you've never heard of before. If so. 
Send in your dreams to Cosmic Tortoise Music at gmail.com. I repeat, send in your dreams to Cosmic Tortoise Music at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you.